John J. McKetta Jr. He was born October 17, 1915, in Wyano, Pennsylvania, the third child of John Sr. and Mary Gillette McKetta. Until the age of six, John spoke only his family's native Ukrainian tongue. His father was instrumental in converting many of Pennsylvania's steam-driven coal mining plants to electric power, which meant lots of moving around. Along with big brother Charlie and big sister Anna Mae, young John had moved eight times by the age of seven, settling finally in Briar Hill, Pennsylvania in 1923. John's father insisted that he finish high school, so John did not enter the coal mining business until the relatively old age of 17. One of the things that I loved learning fairly recently in the last 10 years, <clears throat> a quote of his that I'd never heard as I grew up, and that was what he always wanted to be. He said he always wanted to be a coal miner until the first day that he was one. He grew up in a tough, tough situation. When I was in the coal mine, I read a book by Dr. Porter who said that chemicals were made from coal. And the person that makes these chemicals is called a chemical engineer. And I thought, man, I'd rather be a chemical engineer making chemicals rather than digging this damned coal in this horrible area. And so I applied to different schools. No one had a job for me except for a little school in Indiana called Tri-State University. After Tri-State, John attended graduate school at the University of Michigan. On a fateful night in May of 1943, while working in the chemi lab, John's mercury pump malfunctioned. Frustrated and disappointed, John left the lab and wandered into the Little Shop Cafe, where he ran into the wife of a friend who was serving in the war. He noticed she was sitting with a pretty young lady. That young lady was Helen Elizabeth Smith, who would change the course of John's life forever so they sat down and I asked if I could sit with them and I brought my coffee and sandwich over and we start talking and she was there and she just, oh, well, anyhow, in 15 minutes I proposed. And she laughed at me and said, that's the best come on I've heard. And I said, I'm serious. <laughs> and later that night, I went home and wrote her a note and told her I was serious. And then. There wasn't a day after that that I didn't bring up the thought of getting married, the idea of getting married. By August, she had agreed, and they married on John's birthday, October 17, 1943. After marrying, he finished his PhD at Michigan, working with Dr. Donald Katz on oil properties at high pressure. 15,000 pounds per square inch in those days, we called it high pressure. Today, people are working two and a half or three million pounds per square inch. But in those days, that was high pressure. And it was the studying the behavior of gas and oil underground. What is the composition at different pre pressures and temperatures? And the Maqueda Katz method is still being used we were the first ones to uncover the way to predict this sort of thing. John knew he loved teaching and felt fortunate about the number of teaching positions he was offered. He knew he wanted to do research in the petrochemical area, so the choice came down to Texas or Oklahoma. Fortunately for all of us, John and Pinky settled on Austin. They arrived in Austin on a hot, and humid summer day in 1946, with two-year-old Charlie in the back seat. John began teaching in September of 1946 as an assistant professor, along with Bill Cunningham, Ken Colby, and John Griswold. In fall of 46, the war was just over, 
and young men and old men, veterans who had just got out of the service, <clears throat> were enabled with the GI Bill to go to college. And they wanted to get the very best that they could get, and they wanted to learn it. And it was just a joy. It was a joy. In the spring semester, somehow I was appointed grader for his CHE 317 course. I know 317 was, uh, for me, was the real introduction to chemical engineering, and it was uh, a transformative experience. At that point, I sure in the spring semester, I decided that when I started my research for my master's degree, I wanted him to be my supervisor. Uh, he was just like a breath of fresh air in a somewhat ossified faculty. The one thing I do remember very clearly and very distinctly, if you lost your attention or if someone just happened to nod off, Johnny had a habit of waking people up by throwing a very handy eraser. I can't remember if I ever got hit by one, but I really didn't know how to take that. I didn't understand. I'd never seen that before in my uh, educational experience. By 1948, he was promoted to associate professor. And by 1950, he was nominated to be chair, all while quickly becoming an international authority on the supply and demand of energy. And we were at lunch one day, and Ken Kobe said to Bill Cunningham, listen, Bill, I've been chairman now for four years, and that's enough, it's your turn. And Bill said, I was chairman seven years before that. And Bill Cunningham said, pointed at me, and that day I became chairman. <laughs> Oh, I thought it was a wonderful, wonderful thing, and I wrote my dad right away to let him know I was what a big thing it was. Later, I found out why they didn't want to be chairman, but, <laughs> but uh, it was wonderful. By 1952, I was already professor, so, and had a nice research program going on. Had some PhD, 15. PhD students and things were going very, very well. I actually met him for the very first time at one of his infamous Maqueda picnics. Now, a lot of times when you come into a school as a graduate student, you feel very um, sort of like a fish out of water because the undergrad esprit de corps is, is so deep and so widespread. And you've come from a different undergrad experience and you may come in with kind of different loyalties sometimes. What I thought was so wonderful was that Dr. Maqueda and his wife Pinky just welcomed us all into the fold right away and he never forgot my name after that. It was wonderful. We, we had three acres on Lake Austin and to see all those kids playing games and coming around and enjoying themselves and cooking for all of us, it was great. Except uh, for one thing, what did you cook? Mississippi mud cakes. She made every day, would always say, come on, have I Mississippi usually, mud cakes. Yeah. Uh, you know, he, he adopts people. You know, he's, he's adopted a lot of the students over the years, and uh, I felt like I was being adopted. These are my kids. You, you know, the guys in your class are your, are your family, and you remember your family pretty well. In the mid-'90s, after nearly 50 years with the chemical engineering department, John and Pinky decided to give something back to their extended family. Now, what a unique uh, gesture to look back and take and add up all of his paychecks. I'm like, you know, I'm just going to give all this back. I'm going to ask uh, people who I touched in my life uh, to match that. What those resources have allowed us to do is is basically recruit and retain the best faculty in chemical engineering. Um, it's very expensive to start up a new faculty member and the Maqueda challenge has basically allowed the department to have the resources necessary to attract really great people and give them the resources to start off a, a great uh, research and teaching career at the University of Texas. 
We're just very proud, of course, that they not only made it, they exceeded it beautifully. 15 years after the success of the Maqueda Challenge, we continue to benefit from John's generosity. John, now it is our turn to give something back to you. John has lived a really exceptional life, 95 very well-lived years. And the naming is really to honor, honor that life and what he's given to the department, the Cockrell School of Engineering, and the University of Texas. And so I can't imagine a better time to announce it than on his birthday. Well, I'm just one of thousands of people, literally, who have been affected by John Maqueda. I think just because of his own his own wry wit and his loving heart and everything that he represents. This is, wow, an honor to be able to um, launch an effort like this that, that will honor him in his lifetime. Tonight, we have the opportunity as alums and friends, uh, really not only here, but across, across the world, uh, to move forward with a campaign to raise $25 million uh, in a fund to name the department, the Department of uh, uh, Johnny McKetta, Department of Chemical Engineering. Well, I think it's a great opportunity for all of us uh, who have uh, been the recipients of John and Pinky's love over these years uh, to really demonstrate what they have meant to us. Uh, well, it's every dean's dream to have a, a maritime faculty like John McKetta who have had this, this type of impact on, on their students, on the field, and, and on society. And it's made even more special when thousands of alumni have been touched by this emeritus faculty member. The day that we're able to dedicate the John J. McKetta Jr. Department of Chemical Engineering at the University of Texas as the first named department in the Cockrell School of Engineering will truly be a landmark for our school and for our university. These were his students, these were his family, and for them now to come back and say nice words for, uh, uh, with their memories for him and for mom is very exciting for our whole family. To have Johnny McKetta's name on that department, uh, people 95 years now uh, in the future, we'll stop to ask, uh, who is Johnny McKenna? And somebody will tell them. And uh, he'll be woven into the fabric of this university forever. Uh, and what uh, better person could we have to honor? Uh, and the answer to that is no one. John, you have influenced thousands of lives, young and old, and have left your mark in our Department of Chemical Engineering in a profound way in celebration of your 95th birthday and your 67th wedding anniversary. Here's to you and Pinky and the opportunity we have to pay tribute to your extraordinary legacy. Dad, a happy 95th birthday. Johnny, you light up our lives. Cheers to you. Well, here's to you, John McKetta. Happy birthday, we love you. Happy birthday, Johnny and happy anniversary to you and Pinky. Best wishes to you and Pinky and your family, and uh, I hope that we'll be able to do this toast again when you reach 100. To a great mentor and colleague, happy birthday, John. From one dean to another, here's to a, another very happy birthday, John McKenna. Uh, you have made this world a better place. You've made everyone around you a better person. It's been fun being with you. You're just the best. And I want to say on behalf of Longhorns all over the world, we all wish you happy birthday, Johnny.